We'll now begin, and I leave the floor to Anne Michaud, Dean of HEC, to introduce the ID Solution. Anne? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome, and thank you very much for being with us today. I am Anne Michaud, Associate Dean for Pedagogy at HEC Paris, and on behalf of the board, I am very happy to introduce this webinar today. Uh, we invited Pierre Dussouge, professor at HEC Paris, to talk about the use of strategy thinking to better weather a crisis with the example of the current situation. I also want to take this opportunity to thank First Finance Institute for their partnership in this webinar and in our program Strategy at HEC Paris, where Pierre Dussouge is academic director. So a warm welcome to you as well, Pierre, and thank you very much for accepting the invitation to speak in this webinar. And I leave the floor to you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, hello. Um, I'm very glad to be with you today. Thank you for, for being with us. And uh, we are going to try to discuss um, how strategic, strategic thinking can help to better anticipate um, the consequences of a crisis like that of COVID-19, uh, but also help firms better prepare for uh, future crises or at least weather the storm in better conditions. So we are going to use the example of COVID-19, of course, because we're in the midst of it and you're all uh, living through it. Uh, but I'd like to argue that our way of thinking today could have applied to many other kinds of crises, uh, like the, um, you might remember the mad cow disease, which had a profound impact on the meat market, or 9-11, which also had lots of consequences in a number of industries, in particular air travel. So let me first just give you a few numbers that you've probably encountered here and there, but just that show us the, the magnitude of the uh, impact that this COVID-19 uh, crisis has had on the economy and on particular firms in particular. So for example, uh, in the largest automobile market in the world these days, uh, car sales in China dropped 80% between January and February of this year. That's a huge drop. And actually in the few subsequent months, uh, the same thing happened in many of the other uh, automobile markets in the world. Um, an example from, uh, for us here in France, uh, Air France KLM on June 1st, which is just a, a, about a week ago, was flying about 3% of its pre-crisis schedule. It gives you an idea of how, how hard the impact has been. Um, in the US, 70% of all uh, hotel employees had either been laid off or were furloughed and uh, basically without a job. Uh, and of course, I guess the most dramatic outcomes is that a company as significant as JC Penney's uh, which was one of the major department stores in the US has filed for bankruptcy, as has the number one uh, car rental company in the world, Hertz. And this happened just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, what does it mean? It means that the world looks crazy. Nothing is like it used to be anymore. What does this imply? It sort of suggests, and many people have, have uh, actually took that step, um, it has led many people to say that strategy is no longer useful. And uh, a common quote uh, is this quote by Mike Tyson, which is that everybody has a plan, firms have a strategy until they get punched in the face or until a crisis like COVID-19 hits. And that's exactly uh, the point that I would like to make. Uh, unlike what this suggests, I don't think that strategy thinking is no longer relevant. I don't think it can solve all problems, but I think it can help in addressing some of the problems that are uh, coming up with a crisis like COVID-19. And that's what I'm going to try to convince you of uh, if you're willing to, to follow me on this. Let me just show you a few of the uh, kind of impacts that this crisis has had on firms. Um, I guess one of the most obvious impacts is in market capitalization or the value of companies or said differently in their stock price. And uh, obviously many companies have been hit. 
uh, stock markets have been down for a while and then come back up, but we're going to talk about it. So we can look at the aggregate level if we look at the Dow Jones from mid-February to mid-March, which is basically when uh, the market took the deepest plunge. And we'll look at what has happened since, which has mainly been, for most companies, a period of recovery. So the Dow Jones dropped 37% between mid-February and mid-March from the peak to the, to the lowest point. And it has regained a lot of that loss because it is at minus 8%, uh, or it was at minus 8% when I was preparing these slides uh, just before the weekend. If we look at the French stock market index, just for a comparison, the drop was pretty much the same and the recovery seems to be slower or not as, as significant. And we can look at a number of companies um, because it's interesting to see that some companies have been hit in the same way as the stock market has, but quite a few companies have actually, uh, or there are significant differences from one country, a company to the next. Uh, obviously the airline business, you're well aware, has been uh, hit very um, significantly. Delta Airlines lost almost 60% of its value and has regained a little bit of that, but not that much because it is still down 42% compared to pre-crisis stock price and market cap. In hotels, it's even worse. Marriott has dropped six, had dropped 64% at the worst of the crisis and is back up and has, is only, I feel like saying, losing uh, close to 30% of its pre-crisis uh, market capitalization. Pharmaceuticals, you would think pharmaceuticals would might benefit from a crisis like COVID. Well, Merck, one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical companies in the world is down 19% and it has regained. So it is now even with what it was uh, before the crisis. Um, you probably read that people being confined at home were going to try to keep busy. And uh, one of the things that they can keep busy with is video games. And one of the largest video game companies in the world is Blizzard Activision. And Blizzard Activision actually, for some reason, did not gain immediately. It lost 19%. But maybe once investors uh, came back to their senses, actually Blizzard Activision now is gaining relative to the pre-crisis, uh, to its pre-crisis value. Uh, Ubisoft, and this is interesting because Ubisoft is a direct competitor of Blizzard Activision. It is a European-based uh, video game company. They were down 27%. They've regained uh, some of the lost, uh, lost value, but not completely, and they're still down 11%. Amazon, as you know, well, strangely enough, they did lose at the worst, uh, at the worst moment of the, the crisis. But now they've regained and beyond. They're gaining 15%, or at least they were before the weekend. And clearly, Amazon is one of the winners or companies that has gained from this, this COVID crisis. It's not necessarily true of all the big internet-based tech firms, because Google, or rather its parent company, Alphabet, uh, was down 31% at its worst and is now still down 6% or was before the weekend. And I can't resist showing you uh, the company that manufactures the software that you're all using at this point, Zoom. Zoom was up immediately 51% and almost doubled in value. And what we see here is the obvious effect of investors anticipating shifts in demand for the products of these different companies. I'd like to argue that that's on the surface of things and that uh, we should actually go a little bit deeper and a little bit beyond the effects of just demand. Um, and I'd like to argue that maybe sort of coming back to the fundamentals of strategy thinking can actually help us do that in, in some measure at least. So I like to think that when we're looking at a company, and mainly a company that's in one particular industry or business. I'm excluding here very diversified companies because we would have to do the same thing multiple times. But if you think of companies that are centered on one particular business, 
like I guess Amazon is primarily in uh, online sales uh, or online retail. I'm forgetting about their cloud business, of course, but if you think that uh, Apple is in consumer electronics of different kinds, we could again break it up into different areas, but that would complicate things. What is the basic idea in, in strategy? The basic idea is that firm performance results from two different influences. One influence is the industry in which that firm is operating. So the industry features are a major driver of firm performance. Of course, they affect all firms in a given industry in the same way because they're generic features of the industry. So all airlines are going to face conditions which have to do with the fact that these companies are airline, uh, airlines and operate in that business. And what we can think of is that clearly why, how, and why is uh, the industry going to be a strong determinant of, of firm performance? Well, because it's going to affect demand. And that's sort of what we jumped to when we were looking at the companies and trying to see how their stock price had uh, changed during this crisis. But I think equating industry with demand is a very big shortcut and is clearly um, uh, not sufficient to understand what's going on. Uh, another aspect or another very significant factor is the way in which the costs in an industry tend to evolve. So in some industries, costs are related to size. In some industries, costs are fixed. In other industries, costs are variable. And what uh, customers see in what the industry has to offer is also very different from one industry to the next. In some industries, customers see all products as fundamentally equivalent. They don't value differences. In other industries, on the contrary, the only thing that matters is the fact that we're buying not a generic product from the industry, but that we're buying it from one particular company. Uh, in particular, in industries where brand is very important. Um, well, in that case, clearly, uh, drivers of value are going to be very different from industries that are commodity driven. All of this is going to result in the fact that price competition is going to play out very differently in different industries. And I'm going to try to give you a few examples and try to see how it has affected um, different companies in different industries. And obviously, uh, in different industries, the performance of a company is likely to be impacted differently than in other industries. Why? Just because of the way in which uh, costs are, are, just because of the cost structure in different industries. And so in some industries, a drop in sales is going to lead to dramatic effects on profits. In other industries, the effect will be much more moderate. And that's what we want to try to, to analyze. On the other side, firm performance is obviously determined also by the particular behavior that a particular firm has uh, adopted in that industry. That's what we call a firm's business model. Uh, a business model within a given industry is going to set one firm apart from others. And because of that, a crisis is likely to affect any particular firm somewhat differently from other firms in the same industry. And this might have to do with how much the firm is outsourcing or on the contrary, producing internally. In this particular case, uh, that of COVID, it may have to do with offshoring. Why? Because supply chains have been disrupted and we can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, some firms rely on physical distribution and obviously those firms that have done that have been affected much more drastically than firms that had already moved to internet distribution to a large extent. A firm's asset base is going to impact its performance under crisis in general, but in particular under crisis conditions. And finally, skills and capabilities are going to play a big role in all this. So let's start with the industry effects and let's try to see what we can make of it. So again, I'm going to use the same 
sort of stock market performance and show you the different industries. So we're not looking at companies here, we're looking at entire industries. Now it's difficult to get an estimate of the average industry uh, profitability or of the average industry reaction to a crisis. So what I took here is uh, I took an example of the most representative, what is called ETFs, which are uh, funds that track the performance of multiple companies within an industry. And it gives us, I think, a reasonable idea of what's going on. Again, using the same periods as our, our, our benchmarks. Well, obviously the hotel uh, business uh, has seen its, uh, its market capitalization, the average market cap capitalization drop by about 72%. And by uh, last uh, weekend, it was still 50% below what, is what, what it was before the crisis. In the same way, airlines, we looked at Delta before, well, on average airlines have dropped 62% uh, at the worst moment. And uh, by last weekend, they were uh, only 37% down. Luxury goods, so I don't know, perfume, uh, luxury handbags, luxury app apparel, and products like that were down 42%. And um, last weekend, we're down 10%. Restaurants were down 25% and uh, have regained a lot of their lost, uh, uh, of the lost value and are down 5%. This may come as a surprise to many of you. Again, it is as reflected in an ETF. Pharmaceutical products were down 26, but they have regained all the lost uh, ground. Tech and internet companies have lost, had lost 30% at their worst and now are gaining to a 10%. And finally, video games, which we talked about, dropped 22% at their worst, and now are gaining 13%. So what, what might explain this? And I'm going to ask you to follow, in particular, three of these industries. Why? Because, in fact, it might look as though these industries should be very linked. They're associated, in particular, with travel, leisure, um, when airlines can't fly, well, hotels have a harder time filling up or vice versa. If hotels aren't filling up, it means that people aren't traveling. So these things should be almost equivalent. And what I'm going to try to offer is some explanation of the differences that we see here. So what is it that we're, we're trying to explain? Why is it that different industries are affected by COVID in significantly different ways? Well, obviously, what we think of is the drop in sales. And of course, the drop in sales is absolutely critical, and it does vary from one industry to another. So a few examples in the restaurant business, it is estimated, it's an estimate, that the global seated restaurant sales in the world um, dropped about 80% in June of 2020 compared to June of 2019. In France, automobile sales in April 2020 dropped 89% from what they were a year before. Uh, luxury goods sales, which we mentioned, dropped 35% um, between uh, 2020 and the same period in 2020 and uh, 2019. I think it's the first quarter of 2020 as opposed to the first quarter of 2019. Um, and this is a Bain estimate and the lost revenues would be about $600 billion. More surprising, uh, medicine sales in Poland in April of 2020 dropped 38% from a year previously. Again, this is somewhat surprising and uh, I think it's interesting to see. But some, some industries or some businesses did see their sales grow and that is the case of food retail. So let me try to uh, um, see what this implies. It is indeed a drop in sales. And what do we equate it to in general? We equate it in general to a drop in demand. And in some cases that is true, but not always. And I'm going to try to see why this difference might, might be important. If it's a drop in demand, we can further break it down into different situations. 
One is that sometimes this drop in demand means that the sales that were lost are gone forever. Uh, what some companies during the first quarter or even the second quarter, the sales that they lost during that period will never come back. It doesn't mean the sales level will not go back up in the future, but it means that the sales that they did lose will never uh, come back uh, for these companies. This is the case, for example, and I took very mundane examples, but uh, we're not going to go to the hairdressers three times in a row to make up the lost haircuts when we couldn't leave our homes during uh, lockdown. In the same way, it is unlikely that people will be going back to the restaurant in a much more uh, significant way after the lockdown is over than, um, than they would normally to make up for all the times that they weren't able to go out to eat at a restaurant during the lockdown. But in other businesses, actually the drop in demand is quite different in nature, is that sales are actually deferred rather than lost. What does it mean? It means that if you needed a new refrigerator, well, you probably took your time, you didn't go to buy it during lockdown, or even if you wanted to, you couldn't have. You might have been able to order it on the internet, but uh, you might have been reluctant to do so. So the sales of appliances did drop, but not only will they go back up to a given level, which may not be as high as it used to be, but certainly will go back up, but even a, a portion at least of the sales that were not made during the height of the crisis, those sales will be made afterwards to make up for the sales that were not made during the crisis. Um, now, why am I saying that a drop in sales is not necessarily a drop in demand? Is that actually a drop in sales can also come from a drop in supply rather than in demand. What does it mean? Well, it means that clearly uh, in some industries, the problem was not that people didn't want to buy anymore during the crisis. It's that actually the companies that were in the business couldn't supply the customers that did want to buy these products. Uh, we can all think of these face masks that were in short supply at the height of the crisis. Uh, millions of people were trying to buy them anywhere they could, but for some reason, the companies that were supplying these face masks were not able to produce enough to satisfy demand. And this might have to do, depending on the industry, with the lockdown itself. So if uh, workers can't go work in a factory, obviously supply is going to drop, irrespective of how much demand there is for those goods. In other cases, even if people could continue working and manufacturing could take place, the problem was that the parts that were needed for the assembly of somewhat more uh, complex or elaborate products, those parts were just not plain not available because of disrupted global supply chains. And you can see probably that depending on how different industries are affected by this, the way in which they're going to recover may be different. Also, in terms of drop in supply, inventory is a big deal. Uh, in some industries, there is ongoing inventory, which allows to weather a drop in supply for a certain period of time. In other industries, that is much more difficult. And this might have, for example, an, uh, a way of looking at it is that in some industries, goods are perishable. It's very difficult to keep inventory more than a few days. In other industries, on the contrary, the goods are durable and there are inventories all along the supply chain that might allow uh, to weather the crisis more easily. Think in terms of perishable goods. If you're thinking of uh, seafood, well, it's going to be difficult if for any reason uh, fisheries are closed, it's going to be difficult to continue supplying um, customers. More, I think, interesting because it is somewhat less intuitive uh, this idea that a drop in sales is going to affect uh, different industries differently and that this will affect the performance of companies is very obvious.
But I think what is slightly more um, or less obvious is the fact that the same drop in sales is likely to affect different industries differently. And I'm going to try to give you an example uh, of these different things. Why would a drop in sales affect profitability more dramatically? Well, the greater the amount of fixed costs in the industry, the greater the impact of a drop in sales. Why? Because when there is a drop in sales, if all costs or most costs are fixed, there is not much that a firm can save on uh, in order to reduce its costs and therefore reduce the losses it's making. And for whatever it's worth, this might explain the number that I was asking you to keep in mind, which is that it looks as though hotels have been harder hit than airlines, even though probably the drop in demand was somewhat similar in both industries and the drop in sales was similar in both industries. And why is that? And this is just an interpretation, but it might be because at least when airlines aren't flying, well, they can save on fuel. And in fuel typically accounts for anywhere between 20 and 35% of an airline's costs. So at least when you're not flying, you save on those costs and you're not hit in the same way by a drop in demand as a hotel uh, for which almost all costs are fixed, uh, except maybe labor costs, depending on how flexible labor contracts are. But in the same way, airlines can also sort of uh, manage their labor costs in the same way as a hotel can. The other important distinction is what we call sunk costs. What is a sunk cost? It's a cost that once it is incurred, there is nothing else that you can uh, utilize whatever you have been uh, spending that cost on. In particular, what it means is that the only, if the only thing you can do with your assets is carry out the business for which you set up these assets, it means these assets are not redeployable, these assets are not versatile, you're going to hit, be hit directly by a drop in sales. Again, uh, I asked you to take a look at the, the difference between hotels, airlines, and restaurants. The assets that airlines use, and therefore the costs associated with those assets, are less redeployable than the assets that a restaurant uses. And it's interesting to see how many restaurants, including quite fancy restaurants, that you would typically think of as a restaurant that can only provide uh, sit-in service, well, quite a few restaurants to weather the crisis and to try to adjust um, to the drop in demand actually switched to a takeaway or a delivery model and have continued utilizing their assets, not in full, of course, and not with the same level of sales, but have been able to redeploy some of the fixed costs that they incur, whereas airlines clearly have a hard time doing anything with their airplanes. Uh, than anything else than carrying flying people around with their airplanes compared to restaurants that can either adapt their model or uh, in some cases you could imagine completely using uh, different assets or costs that you've incurred to a different purpose where the, the crisis has, has hit less well. Um, you might uh, remember or have in mind that some firms that were meant to make uh, completely different products have started making either uh, these uh, breathing machines, respirators uh, for people that were suffering from COVID-19, at least in its acute form, or some companies that were manufacturing different kinds of uh, textile goods or different kinds of products in general, were able to, were able to switch over their production to actually uh, making face masks. Um, in addition then, to the features of the industry. And I guess what, what I'm arguing here is that looking at the industry in a much more detailed way, an intricate way, is a way to better anticipate the impact of uh, a crisis on that industry. 
And obviously, if it's COVID, it's going to have an impact in one way. If it's 9-11, uh, it may have a different impact on different industries. We need to tailor this to each type of crisis. But the better you understand what drives profitability in the, the industry, the better you can do that. And then the second, I guess, aspect is the other side of that very simple framework I presented earlier is the firm's business model. One element is how vertically integrated a firm is. What does that mean? It just means how much does the company do in-house rather than turning to outside suppliers to do the same thing. So a company could be, an automobile company could be making its own steel, or on the contrary, an automobile company could be buying steel from a separate company that is a, a steel producer. Well, this in a, in a crisis like COVID, in a crisis that affects sales, is clearly going to have a very significant impact. And let me give you one example that we mentioned earlier. As you know, Hertz has filed for, uh, for Chapter 11, uh, has filed for bankruptcy. And it's interesting to see that Hertz was harder hit than most of its colleagues in the industry. Not that Avis or Europe Car or other car renters didn't suffer. Europe Car is actually in, in big trouble. Uh, they've been bailed out by a loan from the uh, government. Uh, but still, they're not filing for bankruptcy. And there is one thing in Hertz's uh, business model that, to a certain extent at least, might explain that, is that actually most car rental companies don't only rent cars. What they do is they buy cars, rent them to us, to consumers, and then after a few months or a few years, they resell those cars on the used car market. And these car sales actually account for a non-trivial part of their profitability. And in general, these um, uh, car rental companies, what they do, and that's why I use this sign from Hertz, which says that Hertz sells cars as well as rents cars. Um, a, a lot of these car rental companies, what they do is that they lease their, their automobile. And uh, Hertz, even though it, it had the, 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 its inventory of cars financed externally. So in some sense, it was almost leasing. But they leased in a, with a particular contract, which was that uh, they could not return the cars that they had leased to the car manufacturers leasing them to them. Uh, the only thing that they could do was sell them on the market. And in particular, they could not return the lease in order not to suffer from a decline in used car sales or used car prices. And actually one of the uh, very significant effects of the COVID crisis has been that the price of cars has dropped dramatically. Uh, I received an offer and it's perfectly anecdotal of a famous German autom premium uh, automobile car manufacturer offering a 25% discount on some of its more popular models. You can imagine what these kinds of discounts on new cars might do to the uh, used car market. The used car market uh, is dropping dramatically and the prices of used cars are dropping dramatically. And Hertz, contrary to its colleagues uh, like Avis, is bearing the entire weight of this drop in the value of its inventory. And because of this, I think Hertz is in much more dire straits than most of its uh, competitors. And actually the problem Hertz is having is not only it's in, in its rental business, it's actually in its car sales business. And the fact that in some sense, it is more vertically integrated because it tends to own its cars more than its colleagues do. Uh, and we could think of many other examples. The more vertically integrated you are, the more a drop in uh, sales is going to affect the company dramatically because this drop in sales is going to affect all the multiple stages in the business, not only the last stage in the business. Obviously, different companies may choose to uh, offshore more of their procurements or even more of their own manufacturing. And in the case of COVID, firms that have done that to a greater extent have suffered more disruptions in their, uh, in their supply chains and in their uh, overall output. Uh, 
And clearly in many industries, uh, firms have been more or less active or proactive in trying to increase the share of internet sales in their overall uh, business. And clearly in the case of COVID, um, those firms that are more engaged in internet sales have been able to uh, weather the storm a little bit better than those that were selling exclusively in the physical network. And of course, but I, I'm deliberately not talking about this because I think it makes more sense for my finance colleagues to do so. They know about this much better. Different firms may be more or less leveraged. And clearly when there's a decline in sales, leverage is going to hurt. But maybe more important is that different industries are going to lead firms to be more or less dependent on the cash that is associated with short-term sales. The more you have a sort of instant, your sales are based on day-to-day -day sales rather than on long, longer-term contracts, the more, um, uh, the tougher the effect of a crisis like COVID on the profitability of the company is going to be. So let me draw a few conclusions. Our time is almost up and uh, I think we do want to keep a, a little bit of time for questions. Uh, in terms of conclusions, I think that it is clear that strategy won't help us predict what kind of crisis will hit and how uh, dramatic a particular crisis may be. But what it, it will do, and that's where I think we shouldn't throw away the baby with the bathwater, is that the kind of thinking that we use in strategy can help us with, one is not jumping to obvious conclusions that are related only to a drop in demand. I think we tend to think of uh, the impact of a crisis on demand when in fact the impact of a crisis on a firm goes through multiple ways in affecting its profitability. And I think we want to try to disentangle all this and clear it up. The other is that I think our strategy thinking, and in particular, separating the impact at the industry level and the impact at the firm level uh, is very important. Uh, very often, I find that uh, companies tend to bunch the industry effects and the firm effects of a crisis together. And often when things are okay, they tend to uh, assign it to their own firm level choices. But when things are not so good, they tend to believe that uh, the, the cause is at the industry level. And I think being very clear and disentangling these two effects is a very important step in trying to understand how a particular crisis is going to hit us as a particular company and trying to find ways to address it. And I think that the more we understand what's going on, uh, the more we can start thinking about actions that will help the firm to better weather a crisis and maybe even uh, prepare to emerge from the crisis in a better shape than most of its competitors. I think a crisis is also, as uh, I think there's a Chinese saying that actually is explicit about this, uh, a crisis is also a form of opportunity, which is that it's going to create a shakeout in a particular industry. And obviously those companies that can weather the crisis better are likely to see their position, their long-term position enhanced in the industry. And uh, with that, I will uh, stop there. And I will, if you have any, try to address any questions at this point. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Pierre, for this uh, presentation. So uh, there, are, there are questions, there are many questions. So I'm going to start maybe with uh, one or two clarifying question. There is, uh, because I guess that's useful for everyone. There is one from uh, Sebastian that asked a little bit more explanation about uh, the principle of vertical integration, because you talked about it in some, uh, in some sectors. So can you just briefly, uh, uh, just tell a reminder of what this is? Okay, so vertical integration is usually summarized with the, the famous phrase, uh, make or buy 
uh, and vertical integration decisions are make or buy decisions. What does it mean? It means that you might choose to produce in-house the intermediary products or components that go into making the final product. For example, Samsung makes a lot of uh, the components that go into its cell phones. Whereas uh, I guess traditionally, uh, Apple has been known to outsource more of uh, these products to um, outside suppliers. Depending on the degree, actually maybe an even better example than uh, Apple is Xiaomi. Xiaomi outsources a lot of the content of its phones, the phones to other, uh, to, to outside suppliers, independent suppliers. What does it mean? It means that the more integrated you are, the more you are going to have to bear the consequences of crisis, not only in your end business, but in all the intermediary businesses or component businesses that feed into your end business. And it's a well-known fact that vertical integration um, amplifies the effect of a crisis, especially a crisis that has an impact on sales. And because of that, the more vertically integrated the company is, the more vulnerable it is in the situation of a crisis. On the contrary, if the only thing you do is that you package inputs that are produced by others, well, all of these inputs are variable costs for the firm and the company can choose not to uh, bear those costs. Uh, an anecdotal uh, case is Delta Airlines at one point owned an oil refinery in a crisis like the crisis today, I don't know to tell you the truth if they still do, but in a crisis like the crisis today, it means that they have to deal with the crisis as an airline, but they probably also have to deal with the crisis of the oil refinery that was specialized in uh, jet fuel. And uh, because of that, it, it's sort of dealing with two companies that are simultaneously hit by the crisis. Whereas, if, uh, whereas most airlines just buy their fuel from oil companies and they don't have to deal with, they actually can outsource the problem, if I can put it that way, uh, to their suppliers and it becomes Exxon or Shell's problem, what to do with jet fuel that they can't sell. Uh, incidentally, I looked it up, the sales of jet fuel are down 70% these days. So clearly there is a problem there. I hope that answers the question. I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, well, then uh, maybe I will go to uh, questions that are more uh, about uh, the, the presentation and a couple of remarks that uh, this has uh, um, just raised from our participants. So one, and that has been very voted on as a question, so I guess many people are interested to know your answer. Anna is asking, well, today, you know, uh, people are working from home and giving the same productivity, it results in a reduction of, of costs for companies. Um, what do you think whether organization will move towards this direction in the future, or is it something that's going to, to change? How do you see it in organizations? So let me take a step backward. Uh, I think actually that some companies uh, had been using uh, working from home a lot more than others, even before the crisis. Um, what I'm saying by that is that just uh, because of uh, flexibility, because uh, it actually allows for a reduction in, uh, in real estate costs, instead of having offices that can accommodate all employees, working from home is a way to uh, economize on, on real estate costs for in particular clerical kind of, of services inside companies. Those firms have been able to react to the crisis, not that they did it um, in order to better address the COVID crisis, but they have been able to uh, react much faster than others. Now, what may happen in the future, I think that what we're seeing is that a crisis like COVID is accelerating a number of trends and uh, as you know, it's uh, accelerating uh, the digitalization of quite a few businesses. 
it's uh, increasing the impact of, uh, for example, internet retail. And uh, I think in the same way, it's likely to enhance um, uh, the attraction or the, the interest of working from home. Uh, so yes, I do think that uh, there will be some return to more normal uh, or pre-crisis type of behaviors to some extent. But I do think that working from home will remain a bigger, uh, a, a bigger choice or a, a more common choice than it was before. Now, uh, telling you how much I think, again, would be very difficult. And it would be all the more difficult that this is likely to vary dramatically from one industry to the next. So again, even in predicting that, I think that thinking by industry is a very uh, useful way of trying to, to think about these things. Okay, thank you very much. And in the same kind of question about future scenarios, uh, there's also one from uh, Ganda who says many countries are trying to boycott goods from countries like China at the moment. How will it shape the global economic scenario in the future? Do you think that's something that is going to last as well? Well, I think that what is going to happen, and it had already started to some extent, uh, is that there are obvious advantages, but also disadvantages to having uh, very globalized supply chains. There's an obvious disadvantage from, a, I guess, a, a climate change perspective, because it increases the amount of transportation. Um, but what the crisis, I think, has shown as well is that it creates, an, I think the comment is nothing new. Uh, many analysts had already put this forth, but it does reduce the, the, the ability to react rapidly to changes. Um, the, more, uh, uh, the more complex a supply chain, in, in many ways, the leaner the, the supply chain, uh, the greater the impact on a particular company. So I think that, uh, I guess, on, on the issue of, of uh, a globalized economy, Probably politics has a lot to do with it and almost independently from a crisis like uh, the, the COVID crisis. But I think that if you, you combine the two, I do think that at, at least in the, in the medium term future, um, there will be a questioning of a lot of these globalized and somewhat complex supply chains that were the norm a few years ago. Uh, I think the move again was already underway but clearly, I think that the crisis has accelerated that move towards, I guess, uh, closer suppliers, uh, shorter supply chains, and uh, sort of uh, a different way of optimizing supply chains. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think now, in a bit of a different uh, idea, I uh, well, you talked a lot about fixed costs and sunk costs in different uh, categories. And uh, there's a question from David that asked whether you could elaborate a little bit um, on the sunk costs between the airline and the restaurants industry. So maybe a bit of a more of a clarifying part on this as well. Okay. Um, well, the issue is because a crisis like COVID is going to have a differentiated impact on sales in different industries. And in some cases, even on different segments or sub-segments of the same industry. The more a company has sunk costs, the less easily that company can redeploy uh, its efforts towards slightly different uh, activities. Um, so we used to say that airlines uh, were somewhat fortunate because they used assets that were extremely mobile. So if you were an airline and that particular routes became uh, less popular and there was a drop in sales uh, on particular airline routes, for example, because of a political crisis, upheaval, 
So you used to be flying to a region of the world where there has been political unrest and uh, basically people don't want to fly to that destination anymore. The nice thing about airplanes is that uh, the costs associated with operating a particular route are not sunk cost. Most of these costs are redeployable to another route. So you could choose to go to other destinations that are not uh, affected by the same kind of crisis. Uh, if on the contrary, you're a hotel company and you've set up a resort or a hotel in a particular tourist destination, and there is upheaval in that particular country or that particular destination, uh, an asset like a hotel or a resort is, uh, and the costs associated with that asset, those are completely sunk costs. There's no way you can redeploy them to something else. I don't even think you could sort of use the hotel uh, to provide local services. You might be able to redeploy it to apartment buildings or apartment houses or office buildings, but it's unlikely that offices or apartments are going to be in high demand if there is a crisis in that particular destination. So in that sense, it means that the sunk costs associated with a hotel are greater than the sunk costs associated with an airline because the assets are less redeployable. Um, and so I think, uh, I think there is value in thinking about how the assets we use and the costs associated with those assets are more or less sunk or on the contrary are more or less redeployable. Ideally, if all costs were variable, then uh, basically a company could weather a crisis very easily. It would just hibernate during the crisis. All its costs are variable. So when the business goes down, it doesn't incur those costs and uh, the company doesn't suffer. It just waits till business, until business comes back to normal. Unfortunately, no industry is completely fixed cost free, but there are very significant differences in terms of uh, the level of fixed costs in different industries. And in addition, there are very different levels of fixed costs, not only across industries, but also within the same industry, because some companies in particular are going to choose different levels of vertical integration. And therefore, the more vertically integrated companies will have much higher levels of fixed costs. OK, thank you very much. Um, so there are lots and lots of questions, so I must apologize in, in advance that we're probably not going to answer them all, so I'm just taking... Well, I'm sorry that my presentation was so unclear that... Not at all, it's just that it raises many questions. Um, there are quite a number of questions about uh, the valuation of companies and actually probably reacting to the first part of your presentation where you, you uh, told about the the different uh, results for many of them. And uh, there's one from uh, Bogdan and also Alain and several people that ask how to value companies if there are several scenarios and there is so much volatility today that in fact, even the inputs that we have in the analysis might not be uh, very, very stable. So are we guessing or do we know what's going on really? And um, so that's for the question of Bogdan and Alain is adding, uh, shouldn't we integrate evaluation of business resilience in the valuation of companies today? And uh, how would, should we do that? So, so that is a question for finance colleagues, but I'll, I'll try to answer anyway. Uh, basically, again, if, if you believe that financial markets are somewhat efficient, which doesn't mean they're stable, but it means that the guess of millions of people is better than the guess of, on average, of course, than one any particular investor making different choices. If you believe that, the value of a company is very simple to calculate. It's the stock price multiplied by the number of shares. What does it mean? It's the consensus of the markets which is again, millions of investors that see or believe that a company is worth a certain price. 
So all these investors, some of them think the company's worth more, others less, but the equilibrium between supply and demand is the stock price at any point in time. And what is this? What does this reflect? Again, in theory, at least, it reflects the guess that these investors are making on the future cash flows that the company will be able to uh, generate. And my finance colleagues would add that it's the net present value of all future cash flow. Now, what does that mean? It means that as soon as you think that sales are going to go down, well, future cash flows are also going to go down. So you will revise the value that you assign to a particular company. If you thought that a company like, um, I don't know, like uh, Hertz was worth a certain value, and you see that they're renting less cars, therefore getting less revenues, but also that the cars that they're selling, they are selling at a much lower price, you're immediately revising your anticipation of future cash flows and bringing that into the value that you assign to Hertz as soon as you hear that there is a downturn in demand. Uh, not only in demand, actually, also in the price at which Hertz can sell its used cars. Um, and I know we tend to say, oh, but markets are very irrational. Uh, that's an ideological choice, and I will leave it up to each of us to decide if we do think that markets are irrational or not. Um, if they are irrational, I think maybe what they do do is that they overreact to the impact on sales and demand, because that is the most obvious and the most visible effect of a crisis. And that is why I'm arguing that it's worth thinking about this and looking at the impact not so much only on sales and demand, but actually on performance, because performance is what uh, I guess best measures this idea of cash flows into the future. And that's why I think, and that may be one of the reasons why the markets reacted very negatively in a first moment of panic. And then by looking at things in a somewhat cooler way, uh, may have revised their judgment. And then this revised judgment was uh, bolstered by improvements in the overall situation. And ultimately, as we saw, stock prices for many industries, not all, but many industries and for many companies have been going back up after the, the deepest point in the crisis. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so, as I said, there were many, many questions. So, first of all, thank you very much for answering all, many of them already. Uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to, to take all of them because of time constraints. But thank you all for your participation, very active on the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much, Pierre, for, for this webinar. And um, for inviting me. Yeah, and I hope to see many of you on the next webinars. So we have another one this week and the next one will be next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.